Welcome everyone to the Enology webinar series. My name is um, Andrea Botezatu. I am an associate professor and Enology Extension Specialist with Texas A&M, Texas AgriLife Extension Services. And um, today's webinar will cover sparkling wines. And the title of the presentation is Ancest Ancestral Sparkling Wines, A New Old Alliance Under Domestication. Arna Hust uh, Boras studied biotechnology and after studying that and finishing his master in fermented beverages, started his PhD in enological technology in the Rovira y Virgili University in Tarragona, Catalonia, Spain, where he defended his thesis this past June. He developed his PhD thesis on sparkling wines, traditional and ancestral method and also on the effects that climate change is having on the sector. So with that, uh, Arno, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Well, first of all, thank you for your invitation, Andrea, uh, to allow me to present some of the results of this thesis and how they can be applied on the analogical industry. Well, uh, first of all, I entitled the seminar this way because, as we all know, ancestral method is the oldest way to produce sparkling wines that we all know. Uh, but uh, despite being the oldest, we can see that is the one that has been less domesticated and we is the one that less we know. So. Uh, this will be the more or less the schedule of my presentation. First, I will talk about a little bit of uh, the history of sparkling wines. Then I would like to um, further explain what we understand of an uh, ancestral method or pet nuts. Then I would like to comment uh, the results of a couple of experiments that we performed during my thesis and how they can be applied on the sector. And then I would like to finish my presentation with a couple of uh, bottlenecks that we observed on our process and then the conclusions. Well, if we are talking about sparkling wines, first of all, we have to talk about the grape vines. Grape vines were domesticated about 8,000 years ago in what we know nowadays as Transcaucasian region uh, in the countries that are now uh, Georgia and Armenia. Uh, there we've, we've found the oldest evidences of grape vines, um, grape vine seeds and wine production. Um, then, uh, to start uh, talking about sparkling wines, we have to come a little bit closer in time until the ancient Rome, uh, where it, we can find the first written evidences about the sparklingness of some uh, wines. We can think about uh, these wines as artificial intelligence does, like Romans drinking champagne, we should think about the fact that Romans didn't have the technology to uh, microbiologically stabilize the wines. So what was happening is that this wine was in a continuous spoilage. Uh, this spoilage was generating a kind of carbonation that was that the Romans uh, talked about uh, this sparklingness that the Romans enjoyed. If we are talking about the modern sparkling wines, uh, we have to go until the 17th century, where in France, some monks experimented uh, fermentation stops. These fermentation stops occurred uh, during winter, and what they really thought that was happening was that uh, the fermentation had ended. So this is very important that uh, they were bottling the wines and cork capping the bottles. This is important because uh, materia materials that were not corked were permeable enough to allow this overpressure generated on this second fermentation to be released. So what happened with cork is that once the um, spring warmer temperatures reactivated the yeast present inside the bottle, uh, a, re a re fermentation started. Uh, here 
uh, a couple of things could happen. The first one and the most common one was that the overpressure generated inside the bottle made the bottle to explode or uh, that the wines became sp spontaneously fermentation, uh, spontaneously sparkling. Uh, this was a headache for the monks and they were trying to fight against this phenomena. So uh, while parallelly uh, on this uh, process uh, in Great Britain, uh, glass manufacturers, mainly led by Kenan Digby and Robert Mansell, uh, were the ones investigating uh, in order to make the glass more hard uh, in order to avoid the bottle explosions uh, because they were a, were a headache and uh, they were supposing an economical loss. So once the glass uh, of the bottles was um, hard enough, uh, the explosion of the bottles started to be seen less as a problem. And these sparkling wines, these spontaneous sparkling wines, as nowadays we should know them as the first pet nuts, were started to be enjoyed by the English aristocracy. So what the monks thought that it was a headache for the English aristocracy was a pleasant thing. And in the way that it was a pleasant thing, uh, they started to they started a kind of a trend all around the aristocracy of Europe. So uh, this led to the Sir Christopher Merritt uh, to investigate on what was happening inside the bottles. So him we know uh, as the father of the traditional method because he was the first one to provoke a refermentation inside the bottle, adding sugar to a base wine. So what happens when we travel until nowadays? Well, nowadays we are seeing that the evolution of worldwide consumption is decreasing, but the consumption of sparkling wines is increasing. So we have to say that uh, sparkling wines are the, sorry, are the ones that uh, are increasing in terms of value and volume inside the enological sector. We have also to think that uh, inside this sparkling wine sector, uh, people, what is looking for is not just uh, a consumption of sparkling wines in terms of uh, something to celebrate or holidays, but this consumption of sparkling wines is being kind of normalized in a daily basis. So for this daily basis consumption of sparkling wines, what we can see is that the consumer is looking for more and more different styles of sparkling wines. Uh, in this, at this point is when other styles of ancestra of sparkling wines, like pet nuts or forced carbonate, carbonated sparkling wines are started to be seen as alternatives to the classical sparkling wines uh, or champagne. Well, we also have to say that it is not strange to see in a, uh, lifestyle magazines and newspapers uh, making articles and making news about the new or the most uh, um, well elaborated ancestral sparkling wines or pen nuts and we can see that this phenomena as we can see in this some of these articles that i found uh, in the last 15 years we could say all around the world recommend and establish that this new trend is here to stay and we can see newspapers uh, some uh, contests like the Concourse Mondial de Brussels, etc. Well, uh, nowadays we also have to deal with the problem of climate change. As we can see in the first picture, without climate change, the maturation of the grape berries was an accumulation and a palliative accumulation of sugars, while the cyclical loss was also quite slow and the, in the final steps of maturation, uh, flavor potential, which is the combination of aroma and color, uh, reached its maximum point. Well, this happened without climate change, but nowadays with climate change, as we all know, uh, the sugar's accumulation uh, is being faster than usual, while the flavor is not uh, being, accel being accelerated. So most of the wineries will have to deal 
more specifically, the ones that have to work with sparkling wines have to deal with unbalanced grapes. They have to choose to advance the harvest dates uh, in order to preserve the sugar levels and the acidity levels, and they are losing uh, this uh, aromatic aromaticness of the grapes because this aromaticity is still not developed. So in general, we have to work more and more with these unbalanced grapes. So how ancestral method can help us? Well, as we know, and uh, the ancestral method of sparkling wines is only one fermentation based. We will pick up the grapes and then we will obtain the grape juice. Once we obtain the grape juice, we start the first fermentation. Uh, in which that will develop uh, normally until we have a residual amount of sugar that can vary between 15 or between 15 and 20 grams liter of uh, residual fermentable sugars. Once we reach this amount of sugars, what we should do is slow down the fermentation kinetics by uh, adding cold to the fermenting tank or by partially filtrating our grape juice. Well, uh, once we have uh, performed this uh, reduction of the speed of the fermentation, we will bottle the fermenting mast and then this first fermentation will end in the bottle. Once this fermentation has ended, uh, the aging time uh, that the winery will choose will happen and then we will be able to disgorge uh, our product and to sell it. Well, this is a kind of scheme because if we travel in some other areas, what is known as ancestral method could vary a little bit. For example, the most known ancestral method, which is the one used for Blanquette de Limous, uh, does not uh, allow the sugars to finish uh, in the fermentation. So in this way, they obtain uh, low alcoholic wines and with high amounts of sugar. But in what differs this method for the traditional method and which uh, changes, main changes do we have? Well, first of all, we have that uh, for traditional method, as we said, we need to pick the grapes kind of uh, still not mature because we have to add sugar for a second fermentation. While for ancestral method, uh, we do not do this part of adding sugar, so probably um, we can work with a wider window of harvest dates in order to we can let the grapes to develop a more aromatic maturity uh, because this sugar is will will not uh, we don't have the need to adapt this for the second fermentation. Then, obviously, we avoid to add sugar in our base wine. So in an economic level, this might help us because we're avoiding to buy sugar. And then because this second fermentation sugar is provided by our more mature grapes. Then we have an aging thing that as the traditional method sparkling wines usually are sold in quite uh, long aging periods, uh, it is a kind of well known that pet nuts or ancestral sparkling wines are tended to be, uh, tended to be sold in uh, when they are young, when they are younger, so less aging is required. This might help us because we will we won't need to um, have this amount of immobilized stock in our winery. We also can work with less amounts of sulfur dioxide because, as we know, once the fermentation will start, uh, we have our product. Uh, mostly protect by the carbon dioxide that is released during the second ferment during the fermentation, sorry, and we can avoid the use uh, to use the amounts of sulfur dioxide that are used for the traditional method because, for example, for traditional method we need to stabilize the base wine before the second fermentation. Well, we also have to. Um, 
a kind of disadvantage we could say that we have for the ancestral method is that we have to take a closer look for the fermentation. Why I say that we have to take this closer look? Because um, for the traditional method, we just have to wait uh, until the sugars are fully transformed to ethanol. In the ancestral method, we will have to look for the optimal concentration of sugars to be in the grape juice before the bottling. What could happen if we bottle uh, the wine with too much sugar is that the bottles could explode or uh, we will have an overcarbonated product. And if we bottle the fermenting grape juice um, with very poor amounts of sugar, what will happen is that we have a very poor uh, sparkliness of our wine. So in general, uh, we have the difference between ancestral and traditional method that uh, ancestral methods will allow us to work with higher versatilities. Well, and similar of this, which was my hypothesis of the studies that I've performed, uh, is that ancestral sparkling wines can be an interesting procedure to obtain high quality sparkling wines, especially under the current conditions of climate change and new consuming trends. However, we have this lack of well-defined protocol uh, to elaborate this kind of product that makes necessary an optimization of the procedure. For this, uh, our main two objectives uh, that were divided in this different in these two different um, experiments were the first one to stay to set a state of the art in which we wanted to study the reality of sparkling wines in Catalonia elaborated using the ancestral method through the physical, chemical and sensorial study of representative batch of commercial and ancestral sparkling wines. Uh, we focused on Catalonia because it was the, the area in where we are studying, but as far as we have been able to see, the trends that the producers of pet nuts or ancestral sparkling wines that are following the elaborators in Catalonia are quite similar and are very alike to the ones that are following the producers all around the world. And then the, our second objective was to optimize the procedure. Uh, to, for this, we studied how it could be improved, improved the elaboration process of ancestral sparkling wines, and we aimed to determine the critical points that conditioned the quality of this uh, of the final products. Uh, to study this, um, also we wanted to look uh, how the yeast population introduced at the bottling stage of the ancestral method could have an impact on the quality of the sparkling wines. So the first study was an assessment uh, where we compared ancestral sparkling wines uh, and traditional sparkling wines uh, that were bought in wine specialized shops. Uh, with, with performed a uh, full analytics, but with the visual impact that we saw just without opening and analyzing the wines, we were able to see that uh, ancestral or pen nuts were presented with uh, transparent bottles and corked or crown capped bottles, while traditional sparkling wines were more homogeneously presented with cork bottles and opaque, with opaque bottles cork capped. Well, once we've seen this, we are going to see the results, which I tried to divide uh, in order to be more helpful for the for the ones attending this seminar uh, in the analogy sector. Well, uh, we all know that one grapes health indicator is the gluconic acid, and we've seen how. Uh, higher this uh, gluconic acid concentration was for the ancestral sparkling ones, which are represented with an A, and then the T is for traditional sparkling wines. We saw that uh, gluconic, gluconic acid that should not exceed mm, between 200 and 300 milligrams liter uh, was uh, high for some wines. So what we are 
what I want you to look for is that um, even though most of the wines presented levels of gluconic acid that are comparable to the ones presented for traditional sparkling wines, some of them presented levels which could be considered as faulty for uh, the gluconic acid parameter. So in general, we could see that these wines that present very high levels of gluconic acid are the ones um, with not healthy grapes. I wanted also to show you uh, the grapes maturity indicators in which, as you may have seen, glycerol is between grapes health and grapes maturity because some authors suggest that it can be related to botrytis area infection, while some authors um, say that uh, glycerol concentration may increase with more mature grapes. And what we've seen, we, if we look to higher pHs for ancestral sparkling wines or uh, for these levels of glycerol, but also for this, the same ethanol content between ancestral and traditional, we have to remind that traditional sparkling wines were supplemented for the second fermentation, is that in general, ancestral sparkling wines grapes were in general harvested more mature. So here, what we could conclude is that, um, again, again, grapes used to elaborate ancestral sparkling wines are more mature, but in some cases, uh, less healthy. I would also like to say that ancestral sparkling wines um, are an heterogeneous group. As we can see, these larger boxes for a uh, Larger orange boxes represent the results for all the ancestral sparkling wines, while the traditional sparkling wines in general uh, are quite of homo quite homogeneous in size, all despite being elaborated in different wineries. Uh, I would also like to say that um, these larger boxes. Um, that in some parameters, like for example, gluconic acid, um, could be considered uh, as bad filters, are marked because of the presence of some wines inside of the group of ancestral sparkling wines. And then that the maturity level uh, will not compromise the quality of our wine, but the grape health will. Uh, once we analyzed the vinification indicators, we saw that the residual sugars were higher for traditional sparkling wines, and we have to say that it is because uh, they are dosed after disgorgement in order to produce brut or brut nature wines. Um, but ancestral sparkling wines in general are not dosed. Um, if we take a look to the pressure inside the bottles, we saw again the same phenomena happening that I commented before with gluconic acid, and we saw a large dispersion within this parameter, and we have to remind that we are talking about sparkling wines, so the accumulated pressure inside the bottle should be higher than uh, 3.5 bars or 3. So there were some ancestral sparkling wines that presented scarce or no pressure inside the bottles, which could be considered as a fault if we are talking to uh, sparkling wines. Then we also saw high turbidity levels in some, again, in some ancestral sparkling wines that were the same ones that presented high gluconic acid levels and low pressures. So in general, the ones that present the faults were always the same ones. And even though there is no legal minimum of, uh, minimum of um, turbidity units, we should take into account that uh, high turbidities are related to do not call settling the grape juice before fermentation. And this could have an aromatic impact. Uh, some taints could be developed uh, around these high turbidities. And that um, with low turbidities, like for example, turbidities below 50, uh, it won't be a risk to work with these turbidities, but um, because for example, if we go to a supermarket or to, or to a wine specialized store, we will see that most of the ancestral sparkling wines or pen nuts present uh, 
have a presentation uh, quite turbid. But um, this is not a problem, but with very high turbidities like the ones that present these wines shown in the around more than 100 units of turbidity could be problematic. And finally, uh, sulfur dioxide, as I said before, is less used in ancestral sparkling wines, not only because uh, some most of the wineries that elaborate pen nuts uh, tend to work with uh, low intervention techniques, but also because, is, because there is no need uh, to add sulfur dioxide once the fermentation has started. Well, uh, we also characterize the acidic composition, and here what I want you to be focused is into main um, results. The ones are that uh, l malic acid and L-lactic acid uh, were the same ones for ancestral and traditional sparkling wines. So what we are seeing here is that uh, it doesn't matter the method uh, that we used, that we will have uh, bottles that perform the malolactic and bottles that do not perform the malolactic fermentation. So the method is not a problem uh, for this, because we all know that uh, malolactic fermentation can be a headache for sparkling wine producers, but in this context, we we are not we are not doing anything worse than the traditional method uh, sparkling wines producer producers do. And then the second result is that uh, the lactic acid and acetic acid. Uh, were found to be higher for ancestral sparkling wines, again, with the same problematic happening that uh, this uh, significa, significativity is provoked by the appearance of very high values for these both parameters. And I would like to highlight that in this case, again, was the same wines presenting high levels of gluconic acid and lower levels of um, pressure, for example. Well, uh, once we analyzed the, the aromatic compounds of our wines, I want you to focus that uh, for the what we could consider as pleasant aromas, that could be would be the figures A and B, were found to be the same ones for the for both methods. Well, for unpleasant aromas that are the ones in the figure C, which are higher alcohols, uh, were found to be higher for ancestral sparkling wines. Uh, this was again uh, found uh, in the wines that presented large levels of turbidity, which makes us think about the ones that were non cold settled. Uh, higher alcohols are a family of aromatic compounds that probably in the concentrations that we found here uh, are not affecting the aromatic compounds of our wines, uh, sorry, the aromaticity of our wines, but could be affecting other parameters like formability of our wine. And in terms that we are working with sparkling wines, we should avoid any anything that could be working against our formability. Uh, finally, uh, we also analyzed the fatty acids families that are um, related to uh, aromatic precursors, and we found that traditional sparkling wines presented larger quantities of these macromolecules, uh, which is a normal thing because uh, yeast lists that are present during aging in the wine have the capacity to absorb these aromatic precursors. So in the way that in ancestral sparkling wines, we have larger amount of this yeast lease, uh, we will have a uh, higher absorption of these molecules, which could not interest to us because if we'll have less fatty acids, probably we will have uh, less aromatic uh, aromatic precursors released during the while well, this wine is drinked. Once we analyze the color parameters, as we saw that CLAP coordinates, I saw that they are not quite visual for if we're talking in a technical level, because I could say that L parameter was lower for ancestral sparkling wines and, and B parameter is higher for ancestral sparkling wines. And we can see this uh, 
larger boxes, I wanted to translate them to RGB signals in order to make this data more visual. So what we can see is that ancestral sparkling wines present a larger palette of colors than traditional sparkling wines, that this larger palette is not an intrinsically bad thing, but we should focus on the ancestral sparkling wines that present these brownish colors, that are these brownish colors as we all know, are an indicator of oxidation of the product, which means uh, bad analogical practices before the fermentation starts. Because as we've seen, the, once the fermentation for ancestral sparkling wines or pet nuts has started, uh, the product is more or less protected against oxidation. Um, here, I want to remark that this larger palette uh, is a, a good thing to know because, in fact, um, we, uh, we are able to distinguish our product for the, from the ones that elaborate traditional sparkling wines. Well, we also analyzed the macromolecular uh, components of our wines, and when I'm talking about macromolecules, I would uh, like you to imagine uh, two main things that uh, we want. Uh, mouthfeel sensation and farming properties. Uh, proteins and polysaccharides in general will help us to have better farming properties on our wines and in general will help us to have, uh, once we drink our wine, better mouthfeel sensations. In general, we saw that ancestral sparkling wines, uh, again, we see these larger boxes, an indicator of heterogeneity, and we saw that ancestral sparkling wines presented uh, higher concentrations of proteins, probably because ancestral sparkling wines are not uh, dosed with the doses of riddling agents that traditional sparkling wines are, are so we have less proteins removal and we also had a higher polysaccharides concentration. So despite these results, once we analyzed the formability of our wines, as we can see, we analyze it through, mosal through a Mosalux technique, which allows us to divide the formability into in two parts, HM or maximum height of the form, which could be uh, compared to when we serve the wine, like the form that is generated when we serve the wine, and the HS, which is the stable height of the form once we have already served and once the wine is in the glass. What we saw is, despite the previous results, was that ancestral sparkling wines presented uh, lower levels of HA of both the parameters studied. Here, I want you to focus on how large and how dispersed the results are for ancestral sparkling wines and uh, for the traditional sparkling wines are quite more homogeneous. Um, in with this data, what we could highlight is that uh, some ancestral sparkling wines presented uh, uh, sparkling farming parameters very similar to the ones presented for traditional sparkling wines. But also we saw some of the ancestral sparkling wines with no or very poor farming properties. This, um, if we are talking um, in terms of sparkling wines, it could be considered as, as another fault. And I want to highlight that most of the wines that didn't present any farming properties, again, were the ones with the other faults commented before. Uh, so what we could see is that parameters like higher alcohols, oxidation, or gluconic acid concentration could be affecting the formability of our wines despite these wines having the having the opportunity are um, having the macromolecular complex um, composition to have large amounts of this form well and finally i want you to introduce the 
we performed a sensorial assessment in which we asked a trained panel to evaluate these different aspects of the of all the 20 wines analyzed and what we could see here is the average score for ancestral sparkling wines in the orange line while the desviation between wines is shown in the orange ring and the same but in blue for traditional sparkling wines is that ancestral sparkling wines again are an heterogeneous group of wines and in the other hand, traditional sparkling wines are very similar uh, for all the studied parameters in the sensorial assessment, even though they were from different wineries. Uh, I would also like to highlight that ancestral sparkling wines uh, presented larger uh, levels of yeast and breed aromas, which could be related to aging impact and also to the leaves that are present during this aging and lower bubble size and stability than the traditional sparkling wines. I, we also obtained that, uh, again, this palette of colors that I, that I told you before, here we corroborated. And in a way to make this data all more visual, I wanted to form a clusterization with all these all the data analyzed, and what we saw is that two main clusters could be formed. One was full with ancestral sparkling wines, and then another one was with all the traditional sparkling wines and some of the ancestrals. It was curious that all the ancestral sparkling wines that presented faults were found in the cluster one, and with this, I would like to finish this part of the results with two main pieces of advice, is that the diversity shown for ancestral sparkling wines, uh, which is a good future, uh, should be not confused with the presence of faulty products, that we should uh, take an example of them in order to don't copy them. And then that ancestral method allows us to differentiate our products from the other ones because we are able to work with a larger uh, set of variables that we can't control for traditional method. And in this way, we can enhance the offered gamma of products to the consumer. So, seeing all of this, I'm going to present the, the second the experiment that I'm going to show you today that is already available in open access if you want to take a look at, look at it. So here, what we did is we took the same Maccabeo variety grapes and we performed, uh, we treated them in a normal way uh, until the alcoholic fermentation started. Once the alcoholic fermentation started um, and was about to end when we had a concentration of sugars between 18 grams liter, uh, we divided the grape mast in two main, in in two parts. One third was treated uh, in order to obtain a traditional method sparkling wine, and the remaining two thirds were partially filtrated and its fermentation kinetics were slowed down using cold, as I said before, in order to obtain two different kinds of ancestral sparkling wines. One with a higher population of yeasts and the other one with lower population of yeasts. Uh, with this, what we did is we opened the bottles at 6 and 12 months of aging and then we performed all the, um, all the analytics. Uh, here I want to show you the most relevant analytics that we observed and how useful they are. So here what we saw and what I want you to be focused is that uh, ancestral sparkling wines and traditional sparkling wines, despite being elaborated with the same grapes, presented uh, different levels of carbon dioxide pressure, uh, ethanol and sulfur dioxide. dioxide. While higher ethanol levels are perfectly normal because we have to think that the traditional sparkling wines were uh, we need to supplement them with sugar to perform the second fermentation. We also find that this difference on sulfur dioxide levels is forced because ancestral sparkling wines do not need 
this stabilization phase between the first and the second fermentation. So always will present lower levels of sulfur dioxide. And then I want you to focus and remind the first experiment in which uh, the glycerol levels were different and pH also. Uh, that here, obviously, because we are starting with the same grapes, uh, glycerol, pH, tartaric acid or malic acid um, have the same the same values, so it is obvious because we start with the same grapes. Finally, I would like to say that one of the parameters related to some faults that is the acetic acid, as we said before, uh, here was the in the same concentration for all the wines, so we could say that this fault uh, is, we can't attribute the fault of acetic acid to the method used we only can attribute this factor, the presence of acetic acid, that is a marker of vinegar, to bad uh, analogical practices. Well, again, talking about the color, what we saw, eh, I can present the data with the syllab coordinates, and I can say that the significance levels are we didn't see any difference between all the wines and all the parameters studied. But I want again to make this data more visual and what I did, uh, we performed the total color differences in order to make this data more comprehensible. It's been established that if the total color differences between two wines is higher than three units, uh, our A, uh, the human A, will be able to differentiate these two samples. Well, as we can see in this table, uh, only the data that compares the same wine at 6 and 12 months of aging was the one that presented uh, higher differences than 3 units. So this can be reasoned by a normal evolution of color during the aging. Well, if we compare the ancestral and traditional sparkling wines, we didn't see any color differences. Again, if we think about the results in the same exper in the first experiment, we can see that this larger palette of colors um, that we had, and if we focus on this brownish, uh, the brownish ones, we have to highlight again that if we are working properly, these brownish colors can be avoided. Um, well, this is what I said about the color evolution. And finally, here I want to you to think about proteins, polysaccharides, and mannose here. Uh, also, we analyzed mannose because we think that it is um, important to see how its concentration evolves during aging. But in general, what we have to see here is how the farming potential of our wines is evolving and how, again, the mouthfeel sensation could be uh, helped with proteins and polysaccharides. So we've seen that proteins concentration increased in all the wines during this aging due to the fact that an autolysis process is happening. And also in polysaccharides, what we saw was that for ancestral sparkling wines, its concentration increased, which is a, a, good, a good future. Uh, but for traditional sparkling wines, decreased. We have to think that traditional sparkling wines presented uh, 2% more of ethanol, which this ethanol could be provoking a partial desnaturalization and precipitation of our polysaccharides. So these higher ethanol levels are working against uh, the work that the autolysis process is doing. And finally, we saw that the mannose concentration also increased during aging, but uh, for sure, the population inside of lees or, or yeasts inside the bottle is affecting the concentration of mannose, so how the mouthfeel sensation is provoked in our wines. Well, again, studying the farming properties of our wines, we saw that um, there were no differences for both of the parameters studied before, uh, depending on the method. So all the wines presented the uh, similar uh, values for both of the parameters, and all of the parameters increased during aging. 
Uh, if we take a closer look to the HM values at 12 months, we can see that the one that presents higher levels of formability is the high population ancestral sparkling wine. So probably uh, the ethanol, again, the ethanol concentration of the traditional sparkling wines could be affecting uh, the formability of our wine. As we all know, ethanol uh, in high concentration is a form of antagonist, while ethanol at low concentrations can help our form to be stabilized. Well, uh, as I said, there could be a tendency relating formability and the yeast population that we have inside the bottle. But uh, again, if we remember the first study in which ancestral sparkling wines presented lower levels of formability, here the, we can see, again, if this process is followed correctly, these differences are avoided. And in some cases, we could have better formability for our pet nut than for the traditional method. Finally, we performed a sensorial assessment, again, in which we saw that the carbon dioxide aggressivity and bubble size for the same aging time in traditional sparkling wines was higher than compared to the both ancestral sparkling wines, probably because there is more autolysis effect in the ancestral sparkling wines since we have uh, higher yeast populations. And finally, we also found that ancestral sparkling wines presented higher aging character uh, in a sensorial level, probably due to the work that the lease are doing. This is what I said before, uh, that the same age, during the same aging time, uh, the ancestral sparkling wines presented lower carbon dioxide aggressivity, which is a good future for ancestral sparkling wines and that population in the bottle could affect the aging character. And in general, despite we didn't have any uh, significant data, we found that the overall quality, the highest score uh, uh, in terms of overall quality was the low population ancestral sparkling wine. This uh, was probably because it was aged, was found to be more aged than the traditional sparkling wine, but for the high population ancestral sparkling wine, this aging character could be overwhelming for some of the tasters. So in general, uh, even though we are talking about tendencies uh, with poor aging time, ancestral sparkling wines uh, are, can be considered a good alternative to traditional sparkling wines with poor aging. So, seeing all of this, I would like to highlight which, in my opinion, can be considered the bottlenecks, uh, kind of a words game, and opportunities of uh, that ancestral method or pet nuts are giving to us. So, first of all, we can work again with uh, weather maturity levels in the way that we can play with more mature grapes, higher uh, levels of ethanol, more aromatic, uh, more aromaticness to our wines, or less maturity, lower ethanol levels, we can um, play with this. For the traditional method, we can't play that much with this. I want also to highlight how it is important to call settle uh, our grape juices before fermentation, as we've said, it is important in order to avoid faulty aromas, uh, farming loss, or in general high turbidities that some of the consumers uh, should, could be afraid to buy a wine that it presents very high levels of turbidity. We also have the opportunity to work with different concentrations of residual sovers. We can bottle the wine at 18, we can bottle the wine at 10, if instead of a sparkling we want to elaborate a frizzante, or we can play with these concentrations. It is also important to highlight the importance, being redundant, uh, the, to filtrate or partially filtrate 
our wines in order to eliminate the lease that can provoke um, of others or taints. And also it is important to slow down the fermentation kinetics uh, before bottling in order to allow this fermentation in the bottle to happen more peacefully. And also we can play it with aging times. As I said before, uh, it is meant to have uh, high, poor aging times, the ancestral method, but there is nothing written. So we can play with aging times. We can ask ourselves what can happen if we age our product two years or something like this, because in fact, we can play with aging, with the maturity, it will depend on the maturity also of the grapes. And we have the opportunity to work with this. And finally, we also can play with uh, low, lower usages of riddling agents. And we can also uh, work with different kinds of disgorging. Uh, in fact, in Italy, the ancestral or pen nuts are known as col fondo, which means with would be translated with as the lease with the lease. So if we perform a non-perfect disgorgement, which provides us with kind of protection, but also a kind of turbidity, uh, most of the consumers of our product uh, won't be afraid uh, to buy these semi-turbid sparkling wines. And finally, we also have the opportunity to work with less amounts of sulfur dioxide, which is a uh, very helpful thing for our sector, as we all know how uh, sulfur dioxide is started to be seen for the consumer. So finally, I would like to end up with this conclusion piece of advice in which all this data indicate that the ancestral method is a very interesting procedure for elaborating different sparkling wines and that the great heterogeneity observed in commercial products, uh, some of which have been found that they were faulty, uh, suggests the need to develop a manual of good practices for elaborating these ancestral sparkling wines or pen nuts, and that this manual of good practices can be adopted by protected designations of origin or even wineries that are outside of this PDO. And when elaborated with the same analogical practices, ancestral method is perfect. Uh, is a perfectly domesticable tool, as we say it in the title of this um, seminar, and allows us to obtain high quality products. So we we don't have to be afraid of using it. And then the versatility that uh, the ancestral method presents. Uh, situated as a tool that, as I said in the introduction, we've always had, but for centuries we didn't have the technology to control it. But now uh, I'm, I'm sure that we have the technology to control it. And this, with the new consuming trends and with climate change, uh, we are able to rediscover it and to enhance the variety of sparkling wines that we offer to the consumer. And finally, the most important thing we, that we have to focus into is that uh, we, I want you to do not confuse uh, the, the presence of faulty products in the market with the heterogeneity, but also we do not have to confuse these good practices with the diversity laws. And that's been all. Uh, thank you for the attention, and I'm waiting for your questions. Can you briefly explain this? these two images, how they're different and what they show us? Well, uh, probably it is not clearly seen, but well, I wanted to put the title, but I, I think that I could edit editing all the diapositives and this thing. But in the first picture, I don't know if you see the arrow of my PC. But uh, the first one uh, shows the ideal uh, maturation process without climate change, uh, where the sugars are accumulated slowly and the acidical loss is also slow. 
And then the second one shows the process that is more and more common to happen uh, when we are talking about the climate change effect on grapevines, in which these sugars the sugars are accumulated faster, and also the acidic concentration also decreases faster in our grapes. So in fact, this is why most of the wineries are advancing the harvest date because they want to work with low sugar concentrations and high acidic concentrations. And in fact, what is changing is that these sugars and acidic um, conversion, we could say that way, is um, happening faster. But the flavor potential, which is the accumulation of aromatic precursors and uh, color compounds, is not being accelerated in the same way with climate change. So in general, when we are picking the grapes uh, earlier in order to preserve the acidity and the uh, concentration of sugars, we are losing aromaticity of our grapes and color, even though we know that color is not that important in sparkling wines. Thank you. Um, next question is, are ancestral method wines less amenable to adjustment due to being in a sealed bottle? Less? Uh, less um, friendly to adjustment, less likely to be adjusted. Well, I don't... They are... Uh, if adjusted, you are meaning that you can't correct the CDT or things like this, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, yes, of course you are able to, you are less able to correct these parameters, but um, I think that it is also a good future because you can work with correcting other parameters like in the parts of the process, as I said, like you can work with different types of maturity and in general, you should, you, you have time until the bottling time to correct all the things that you need to correct. I don't know if this, is this the question. I'm not sure either, but <laughs> I hope I hope I hope so. Um, there's a question about cost. I don't know if you looked into that, but uh, the question is cost of production um, versus traditional method and tank. Yes. Is it cheaper to do well, the ancestral method? Yeah. The tank. Uh, I method? want. I want to say that uh, the the scientific study of. Uh, this method is very poor and scarce, so this could be, uh, this should be uh, analyzed in the way that uh, it is cheaper or not. But in my opinion, in the way that you are avoiding to use sulfur dioxide, you are avoiding to buy sugar, you are avoiding to buy uh, amounts of leading agents, I think that it could be cheaper. But um, it I think is the important labor is that... less too with the ancestral method. You there are steps that you don't have to take. Um, exactly. So labor cost goes down as well. Yes, and I think that you have to think that uh, probably. I don't know. You have is what I said that you need to. You do not need to have this uh, immobilized stock the same time that you will have the traditional method sparkling wine. So probably uh, it is cheaper and uh, and you sell it before. So yeah. in general, the circle that you do uh, is smaller. So you receive the compensation before. Thank you. If you could move to the slide where you showed what you did, your research, so the, the process from grape to press to tank. The second result. Yes, the second part, yeah. The schema, yeah, that one. Okay, so um, you have the grapes, you have the press, and then you have pressing at a 60% under pressing. What does the 60% represent? The 60% represents the, the yield 
I think that it is said the yield. So we, if we start with a uh, hundred uh, kilograms of macabeo, uh, we end up with sixty liters uh, of grape juice. Okay, thank so you. So we don't press uh, that much the grapes. So we have a, yes, a, a yield. I think it is said yes. Thank you. Next slide. You had one with some tables where you were reporting results side by side. In the first or in the second? Or just after this. So you were presenting your results. Yeah, in that table. Yeah, this one. So what does HPA and LPA stand for? HPA? Okay, here, I as I said before, um, we elaborated two different styles of ancestral sparkling wines. Uh, they were only different for um, the inoculated yeast population inside the bottle. So HPA stands for high population ancestral sparkling wine and LPA for low population ancestral sparkling wine. Be but I forgot to introduce how we abbreviate it. So these are the differences between both ancestrals. Thank you. Um, next question is, I notice a lot of pet nat wines use skin contact over a number of days in the production of the wine. Can I ask the advantages, disadvantages of this? Well, for me, I think that this is quite, for me, we are, we are, if we are talking about wine, white uh, pet nuts with white varieties. Uh, probably you are, mm, well, wineries are working with it in order to uh, provide the wine more complexity. But also for me, as a point of view, it could be an error because uh, you are risking the product to have uh, more oxidability, which in general could damage your farming properties and also because it could add uh, some um, a higher polyphenol a total polyphenol index which is again i which is not going again to help uh, the farming properties of your wine and so in my opinion, I think that mm, this is a practice that wineries are doing because, as I said, the ancestral method is not um, is not well established. And probably because we are going like, what could make me as a winery differentiate my wine from another one uh, without further knowing why we are doing this, probably. Uh, in my point of view, um, we are doing this because we don't we want to differentiate our product from the other ones. But in my point of view, I think that it is not helpful at all to do this. Thank you. Next question: If planning to ferment and then disgorge, what is the recommended range of residual sugars at bottling time? Well, here, as I said, uh, in Catalonia, and I think that in most of uh, places that pet nuts or ancestral sparkling wines are elaborated, uh, are used. Um, I think that you asked once we are disgorging on when we are bottling. At bottling time. At bottling time. Well, I think that... Uh, we should be around uh, 15, 16, because we have to think that we, depending on what uh, processes we've performed to our fermenting mast, we have to think that we already have uh, our liquid saturated with carbon dioxide. So uh, I think that once we should avoid uh, bottling over 20 grams liter, of residual sugars. So at 18, that was this second experiment that we presented, was quite uh, quite high. So probably at 16 could be better. So this is what I said before is um, at the end, it depends on which product do you want to 
to elaborate. If you want to age quite longer your product, you can bottle at 20 because you will have some pressure loss during the aging. But if you want to elaborate a, a frizzante wine, that it is a wine that it it is not sparkling, it's just it just presents some fizziness. You can bottle at 10, 12, but in general, I would bet that 16 is okay. 15, 16 grams liter. Thank you. <clears throat> Did you find high gushing rates in the ancestral sparkling wine high with CO2 pressure of four? Well, when we are talking about the commercial, uh, if we are talking about the commercial ancestral sparkling ones, I would have liked to find gushing because, in fact, what I found was the complete opposite, uh, where we were uncorking pet nut bottles that did not present any mm, pressure and were like steel wines. So this was nothing about gushing and if we are talking about the the ancestral sparkling wines that we elaborated uh, in the second um for in the second study uh we didn't see any gushing happening so all the wines once we disgorged them uh behaved uh like in a normal way like in because we do in the university we perform the disgorgement manually so we didn't find any differences between traditional and ancestral sparkling wines once during the disgorging. Thank you. If you could move to the slide where you have your sensory evaluation spider web spider plot thing. My yeah yeah I that did... one. This one a thirty I think yes. Okay. You have um, overall quality. Um, marked there. The question is, how was overall quality assessed for the 12 months aging study? Well, as I said that we didn't find any significant differences in overall quality because as despite being a trained panel, uh, we have to take into account that each judge has its own preferences. Um, we asked um, the um, in general, uh, in normal conditions, we should we could ask to the judges uh, between the three tasted wines, which is the um, prefer preferred and the least liked product. Uh, but here we had, like for all the parameters, a scale that went from zero to scale to no presence of this parameter until ten with. Uh, an extreme of this parameter. So we asked the judges to point uh, 10 if they really liked this wine and zero if they didn't like. Then we normalized the results using the, soft, the software, which is panel check, I think. So we can, in a way that it is also a trained panel, uh, it is kind of uh, easy to normalize the results. Thank you. So you did descriptive analysis for this? Yes, uh, like yeah. for all the parameters. And and the overall quality was uh, ranked as a liking yes. on a scale of 0 to 10. Yes. Thank you. Um, another question about this, how were these qualities, gen general qualities measured? I think you answered that a trained panel and scales. Um, so 15 panelists from what I see in your panel uh, using descriptive analysis. Another question, at what percentage of alcohol is the wine sent to bottle? Uh, well, um, if we are talking about the ancestral sparkling wine, here is what I said uh, in the uh, question that of before, that it depends on what you are looking for, but the most, um, if we are talking about ancestral sparkling wines, what I should recommend is that do not 
uh, look uh, look for the ethanol concentration that you have on your fermenting grape juice. You should look for the residual sugars that you have on your uh, fermenting mast because they're the ones that will generate this sparklingness inside the bottle. And because if you are talking about a single fermentation and you have a healthy population of yeasts, that is what happens in most of the times, uh, you don't need to worry about a fermentation stop because the yeast population is already adapted to this media. I don't know if the question goes around here. No, that, it makes sense, really. Um, yes, the, the alcohol can vary depending on the starting level of yes. sugar that you, you have in your grapes, and then the style of wine that you're trying to produce, therefore the residual sugar at which you're bottling. So yeah, there's yeah. not a set level for alcohol. In the fact, your... I... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. This is a common error for some sparkling, some ancestral or pen nut wines producers that instead of looking the residual sugar, sugars, they look for the density. So we have to know that the density uh, will vary in function of the, uh, of the grape mast that we have started. So uh, it is better to look for the residual sugars than for the density because density can uh, cannot be an objective way to to know how many sugars do we still have in our wines, how much sugar. Yep. Thank you. A question that may or may not have to do with your research, but do you know anything about the progress uh, in developing sensors that can be placed into the bottle during production? The sensors, uh, referring to how the how the fermentation is performed. Well, uh, when we analyze, um, when we follow the second fermentation in the case of the studies that we do uh, for traditional method and also for the, the fermentation in the bottle in the case of ancestral sparkling wines, we have um, a machine that allows us to calculate the pressure inside the bottle without destroying the bottle because we know that there, is, there are these kind of caps with the manometer that allow wine producers to know how the pressure is being accumulated for the sparkling wines, but they are, uh, it is a destructive method, but uh, our university is a ca uh, equipped with a machine that is called uh, CO2 systems fit, something like this, that allows us to monitorize how this second fermentation or just the fermentation in the bottle um, is being performed. And we know that the pressure uh, starts uh, from one atmosphere that is the one that we have and it increases in the way that the second fermentation uh, is being developed. So I think that in the second, in the methods of the experiment that the second experiment that I presented that it is already published you can find the the name, the complete name of the machine. Thank you. Which, um, does the low population of yeast mean that it was inoculated with less yeast or was it more heavily filtered? Yes, it was more heavily filtered because we have to think that we have, when we do this filtration, we have a very large amount of yeast. So what we did is we partially filtrated a part of our grape mast and then we we mixed this filtrated part and the non-filtrated part until we achieved um, basically uh, six per um, six millions of cells per milliliter for the low population ancestral sparkling wines because it is normally the concentration in which the traditional sparkling wines reach at the end of the second fermentation 
And then the one that presented high population, uh, do we doubled its population and we had uh, 12 million cells of per milliliter of wine. Thank you. And that was through inoculation with a selected yeast. Well, we, in order that the, in order, sorry, in order that we were working with the university and we wanted the results to be comparable, we inoculated in the three wines, well, in the fermenting juice before separating it with the, with the commercial yeast. And then, for example, for the for the ancestral sparkling wines, we didn't need to re-inoculate before the bottling. But for the traditional method, for the second fermentation, we again needed to re-inoculate the same yeast. Right. Makes sense. Yes. Um, fantastic presentation. Will the slides be available after? Um, so we are recording and posting this on YouTube, but Arno, are you willing to share your slides as well? Yes, for sure. Yes, thank you. Uh, question about um, canopy management. Do you, well, do you have any information about that, Arno? In a way that, uh, well, we did, we focused just on on the analogical part. So mm -hmm. we didn't focus yeah. on the on how the crop uh, the crop vegetative part was treated, mm -hmm. but in the way that all the grapes came from the same uh, vineyard, uh, we have to think that they were all the same. Mm -hmm. Why can't I find? ancestral method wines that have the delicious autolysis of traditional method wines? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think that because you're looking in the wrong place, <laughs> this could be the, the fastest answer, but I think that it is because, um, as I said before, the method for ancestral sparkling wines uh, even though it is still not so well defined, uh, we have to think that we are working with, in general conditions, more mature grapes. So instead of looking uh, long uh, autholysis, uh, we are looking for, in a way, more faster, um, faster product. We, as I said before, uh, in general, pen nuts won't be aged more than, for example, two years. And two years is quite a long, a lot. So also because we can't, I, in my opinion, this is an opinion, is because if we are, if we are not partially filtrating, so we don't control the lease that we are putting inside the bottle, we could be committing a risk we can because we don't know if a part of the list that we are putting inside the bottle are a part of this bad list or a part of this good list. But I think that once uh, this process will be further studied and wineries will know um, more about this process, we will be able to find uh, largely aged pen nuts, but I want to insist that it is because uh, pen nuts are not meant for aging as traditional methods. So we could consider them as two different styles of sparkling wine. Thank you. And the last question so far, um, how does high alcohol lead to high turbidity? Well, high alcohols is not about high turbidities, is the higher alcohols, which is um, this um, um, uh, aromatic precursor, sorry, uh, that the family is known as higher alcohols. Uh, we know that uh, high turbidity levels are related to the presence of high turbidities. So it's not that the presence of higher alcohols provoke 
provokes high turbidities, it is because high turbidities uh, and that are generally related to non-coal settling and the, I think that it is the nitrogenous um, uh, metabolism of yeasts of the molecules that we eliminate with coal settling. Uh, if we do not coal settle the product, uh, this uh, nitrogen metabolism of the yeast will generate higher levels of higher alcohols. So if we coal settle our product, we will have less turbidities and so less higher alcohols. I don't know if I resolved the question, but... I think so. Thank you. That is the last question that I had. So um, unless there are further questions, I am going to thank you, Arna, for taking much longer <laughs> than I we mean. anticipated um, to be with us and, and um, do this presentation and answer all these questions. This was a really, really interesting talk. Thank you to everybody who attended. Um, and with that, I will say... Goodbye, cheers, and see you all next time.